Hello, everyone. Welcome to Libraries in Response, session 98. 98 since we uh, began in March of 2000. And here we are, four plus years later, uh, still, still at it. So let's see, is that uh, visible? Is that showing? Is that screen sharing? Okay, thank you. Um, so Libraries in Response Session 98, prompting McLuhan, uh, kind of a play on the, I don't know, could be the word of the year, prompt, uh, but in relation to AI, which is uh, part of what we're talking about. But we've all been kind of lost in this topic. But let me get to that when we get to the subject material. So uh, is AI a new media? Uh, well, if so, then what's the message? According to McLuhan's uh, famous quote, the medium is the message. So we're going to be trying to seek insights into the nature of AI as media, if we understand it that way, through resurrecting uh, Marshall McLuhan and trying to apply some of his insights to this current technology. We have uh, Andrew McLuhan and uh, Jeff Pooley with us today, who will be our, our speakers and our, our guides into McLuhan's thinking. So we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, we're 13 year old consortium of libraries doing interesting things, we think, with technology and innovation. Our uh, sessions are recorded and hosted by IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, based in The Hague, with Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy at the helm, uh, which we, of course, appreciate, longtime partner in public access. We've been working on that for even longer as a, a, a principle and a goal of universal public access. That is to say, every community should be connected. Every community should have a library. You could even define a community as a place, a geographic place with a library in it, but that's for another topic. Our sponsor, uh, principal sponsor this year is IMLS. Uh, a very generous uh, grant has helped us keep this thing rolling. So we have other sponsors, including the Internet Society, uh, the Library of Michigan, uh, Library of New Jersey, Texas, and a couple of media sponsors, the Library Journal and Broadband Breakfast. So this is our <clears throat> almost book. We can always use as a logo. I mean, this started as a response to the global pandemic. It's hard to remember the kind of mind space we were all in at that time. It shook the world in an instant. Overnight, we were all you know, what is going on? And um, as in every crisis, libraries are called upon to respond and to, you know, help their communities deal with whatever the crisis is. It's one that, you know, resonates today uh, in that AI, which is what we're talking about today, uh, you know, the new four horsemen here of the apocalypse as uh can be a considered a crisis if we agree that it has massive disruptive uh, capabilities and it's also global, which it is. And, and it's also arriving, at least in terms of generative AI. AI itself has been around for a, quite a while. We've been experiencing it indirectly through back-end systems and, and capabilities, you know, your, your, your Siri, uh, you know, a Alexa or AI-driven, uh, machine-driven uh, trading in the financial markets has been around a long time, but only just now it's been in the hands of users, end users, like the hundreds of millions of people that are now playing with it. And uh, the, the world here is longing for the good old days of simply worrying about nuclear annihilation, which does not seem to have gone away in spite of the fact that we don't pay much attention to it. So here we are. Uh, this was just this week, Warren Buffett comes out with this, with this quote, you know, that uh, this is analogous to nuclear weapons. Uh, Warren is not noted for his hyperbole. 
And so I think this should get everyone's attention. And and hopefully it does. If if the Oracle of Omaha thinks that it's this significant, then I think we should take some extra time. That's what we're going to do. And then this last point about scamming, which I think is really brilliant. Uh, if there's a growth industry, you know, that's going to be it. Already we're besieged with extremely clever uh, ploys to extract uh, money and time and endorsement, whatever, from these uh, fake uh, uh, solicitations. Now kind of being supercharged with AI. And like he, he says there in the, you know, in the second quote, his, uh, he was recently, you know, resurrected as an AI and he could have fooled his own family. So I think if if we think we're sort of, well, that's for just really the clueless people, I think we're kidding ourselves. This is a list of sessions that we've done on AI for the last four years. Uh, I, actually, I didn't, it's not updated. To, we just did one last, uh, last week. Uh, those, by the way, are all available on the Libraries and Response YouTube channel, which I suggest you check out and uh, subscribe to. So this is, uh, I really like this one from uh, Jesse Hirsch through in the, in the Medium, interesting titled uh, website, uh, characterized by the omnipresence of AI and McLuhan's seminal concept. It couldn't be more relevant. The impact of any medium is far greater than whatever the content is delivers. That to me is the essence of the message, of the, you know, that the medium that the message of the medium is the impact. So that's, of course, how most people know of Marshall McLuhan. And then I think the second one, everyone kind of recognized, everybody's sort of heard this. They may not they know where it came from, but, you know, that's what I believe, where I believe it did come from, is Marshall McLuhan I saw that. And I love this one. I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. This is so true. You know, we are just riddled with bias. This is the way we see the world. We're conditioned through culture and inclination, whatever, to see what we feel we want to see and, uh, and what we believe. So that makes it difficult to actually be so-called objective, if that's even possible. And then this last one, which is really relevant today, is once you see the boundaries of your environment, they're no longer the boundaries. Well, that's fascinating. That's typical of kind of the thing McLuhan would say is, you know, you don't think of it like that. Uh, and yet this makes you consider something I'm sure you haven't considered before. And and that's relevant. So uh, this is from uh, 1977, uh, take today, one of his one of his publications. Uh the basic principle of media observation is, is putting one medium inside of another. And that's the point I'm going to try to make, or the question I'm going to try to pose here. The origin of visual space, he, he points to the, to the arch inside of the rectangle, and that then the arch becomes art. And when the movie became the content of TV, TV was elevated to, uh, 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 well, he, he makes the, the comparison that, that, Movies had been originally popular entertainment, right? We went to the theater, the actual live theater. And then there were movies, which are sort of a cheap knockoff of actual theater. So they were just kind of, you know, uh, popular. All right. So then um, uh, TV, which we thought was eternal and perpetual and a bane, that was, he was making sense out of TV in, in the 60s. And Andrew, maybe you can verify this. The, we heard that he prohibited his children from watching TV, but I don't know if that's true. But anyway, he was he was making sense out of TV as a medium and and in general. But TV and TV advertising were extremely powerful in the '60s, and that's uh, that's that gave him rise to make sense of it and inform a lot of us about TV. So. That happened again in the 90s with the arrival of the web. Uh, the, you know, we called it the internet, but it was the World Wide Web, a graphic version of the internet. And so McLuhan was brought back in the 90s. Well, what does this all mean? And once again, the, his, his principles 
uh, applied. And since then, the web has enclosed TV. And now AI seems to be enclosing the internet. So if we follow this principle, does that then make the internet art? <laughs> well, I don't know. Hopefully we can get some insight of that. So here we are uh, to our speakers. And actually the reason that you showed up today, I hope because Andrew and Jeff have spent a lot of time thinking about the meaning of McLuhan and understanding McLuhan, which is kind of a play on one of his one of his volumes, Understanding Media, uh, a classic textbook. So many people in the so-called media industry, which we didn't have before McLuhan, cut their teeth on trying to understand McLuhan's insights. And I would say all the power people of the media industry, especially 20, 30 years ago, uh, drew drew insights from McLuhan and that um, that helped their careers and also helped shape the, in, the environment we're all living in now. So with that, I will uh, introduce uh, Andrew McLuhan, uh, grandson of Marshall McLuhan and also the head of the McLuhan Institute in Canada and ask him to take us away. So welcome, Andrew. Tell us, okay. tell us what we're what what we're looking at. <laughs> uh thank you very much, Don. Um you uh you left a lot of a lot of crumbs on the table, a lot of little oh. to pick up. Uh, it's almost hard to know where to start. I'd love to just respond to everything you said, but uh, I didn't know that um, Warren Buffett was called the Oracle of Omaha. That's kind of yeah. interesting. Uh, Marshall McLuhan was at one point called the Oracle of the Information Age. Uh, we seem to like make making profits out of people, uh, even as they make profits for us sometimes. Uh Interesting. I'm going to disagree with with Mr. Buffett. Um, he believes that uh, that the genie is part way out of the bottle. I think we we <laughs> let the genie fully out of the bottle when we release things like Chat GPT. Uh, has the effect of dropping Big Boy on Nagasaki or Hiroshima or anything else. Um, it's not really any putting it back in the bottle anymore. That there is putting those bombs back in the the cargo hold of the airplanes, you know, they're there. Um, you know, you, you mentioned about uh, Marshall prohibiting his children from watching television. Uh, interestingly enough, he, he addressed this. Uh, a lot of people think the medium is the message comes from understanding media in 1964. Uh, I've actually spent when I when I started the McLuhan Institute back in 2017, 18, I decided to focus on the medium as the message just because it's such um, such a touchstone for McLuhan and such a powerful insight. Uh, it's funny, you know, five little words, the medium is the message, and yet there's uh, so much in there. there. There's a galaxy in there. But um, Marshall actually wrote a, a fairly lengthy article in 1960 published in the Houston Forum called The Medium is the Message, so four years before Understanding Media was published. And in it, he says, in Understanding Media, we might check whether the current familiarity of children with photo and television, for example, before they read and write, might really be an unfortunate sequence. And the reason for that is because you only have you only get a, a one chance at a first impression, you know, and this is as true with meeting people as it is with learning your mother tongue or your mother media, as the case may be. Um, and this is what Marshall was talking about here. Um, the main, the main, if there's a McLuhan theory of communication, a model of communication, it has to do with how media or technologies affect us on a sensory level. Okay, so this is not about our opinions or uh, 
in that sense of how we feel about things. But to back up for a second and go back to our senses, our interface um, between our interior lives and, our, and the exterior worlds around us, some of which we sense and some we don't, um, like infrared light, which we, we can't sense directly, right? There's, there's certainly a, a lot in the world and the universe which we simply don't have the equipment, the sensory ability to experience, um, which isn't to say it doesn't exist. So the McLuhan model of communication, if there were one, would start with the senses and how um, data and information and experience uh, don't simply go through passive senses, but shape them along the way and shape us. Um, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us is actually John Culkin's paraphrasing of Winston Churchill who said, we shape our buildings and thereafter our buildings shape us. Well, Culkin brilliantly reformulated this to kind of encapsulate McLuhan's theory of communication, which is that we shape our tools, we shape our technologies. Our technologies then shape us personally and socially. There are these two order of effect. But really, it begins with the individual, individual and, and cascades out from there. And it really has so much to do, everything to do with our senses. Marshall liked to um, use uh, this book, And There Was Light, by Jacques Lucirin, as an example. Uh, Jacques Lucirin was a, a prominent figure in the French resistance in World War II, and he was blind. His, his wonderful book, And There Was Light, talks about how he became blind in a schoolyard accident uh, and almost completely blind in just a matter of, of days. Uh, and it it details this change, uh, particularly on a sensory level. He talks about how as his visual faculty dimmed, his other faculties, his other senses took up the slack so that he couldn't see any longer. But his hearing, his touch uh, became more acute, heightened sensation. And that, that goes to demonstrate how our senses uh, exist in a balance among them, all our senses, not just the most commonly recognized senses like sight and touch and sound and smell, but all our senses, like our sense of our, ourselves in position with the world and objects, proprioception. We have dozens of senses, really. Um, we just don't really pay attention to them. Um, and what he learned or what he's able to demonstrate through Lucy Rand is this principle that to affect one sense is to affect all our senses because the senses exist in a living balance or ratio among them. And we are the product of that ratio because all our values, our concepts, our feelings on things um, flow out from our senses. For example, with the case of the blind person, um, the blind person doesn't really care very much what color my sweater is. Uh, it doesn't care for the decoration of my office. It doesn't care for artwork, for visual art. Why would a blind person care about Degas or Picasso? Uh, but we very much do. They're a, a very important part of our, our culture. Um, so you see how sensation is the base and the ratio of our senses shapes who we are as individuals. And when we get our, ourselves all together, we we have culture. Um, and that kind of goes to that, that other statement of, I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it, uh, because really a large part, a large part of perception is about shortcuts. Uh, and this is kind of how AI works as well. AI is, is all about predicting and filling in the blanks, uh, just as, as we are, you know, that's how we can take words and and throw the letters in a different order, but understand the meaning, if you've ever seen that example. Um, we see what we expect to see more times than others. Uh, and that, that goes for a lot of things. But um, so the medium is the message, which, which I think is the cornerstone of McLuhan work, it goes back to 1958 at a, a radio broadcasters conference in Vancouver, BC. Uh, where Marshall was invited to speak as a, a communication expert at the time. Um, 
and they were really uh, concerned about television. Uh, television was overturning uh, the media landscape, uh, just as the internet in turn overturned the television, the media landscape of the day, and supplanted uh, television. This upset the upset the the TV people and before them the radio people because, of course, uh, advertising goes where the people are. Uh, and advertising is, is how so many of these platforms make their living. Uh, so if the audience shifts, the advertisers shift, and so the economy shifts. This is this is a big problem. But um, the radio people were, were concerned about television killing radio. And Marshall had something else to tell them, uh, you know, to your point about the art form, is that uh, you know, a new medium doesn't kill an old one. Um, it changes it. It gives it a new role in culture um, and tends to turn it into an art form where the new form is often seen as kind of, as popular and therefore kind of vulgar. Um, fiction uh, novels, detective novels were seen that way. Comics were seen that way. Radio was seen that way. Television was certainly seen that way um, until it uh, something new comes along. And then the old thing all of a sudden uh, takes on a different uh, meaning for us in a different role. And it rarely disappears. In fact, it's it's usually it usually plur, plur, sorry proliferates and is reborn uh, like books today. Um, books as a mean for means of sharing and receiving information uh is not on center stage but we have millions of books published or spread every year the book is is far from dead but it takes on a new meaning um and really we can talk for hours and hours about what the medium is the message means it's uh kind of wonderful in that way um it's poetry and McLuhan was uh, a lover of poetry uh, a teacher of poetry, an expert in poetry. As he was trained as a literary critic and remained a uh, professor of literature at the University of, Tr of Toronto for his entire career. He got into communication and media study as a kind of side hustle, um, and it took over everything. But uh, the important thing to note is that really uh, how he did what he did was he took his training in liter literary criticism and turn the same tools toward technology and culture in a broader sense. Uh, it really, it's really as simple and as wonderfully complicated as that. But what the medium is the message means rests on what, what medium means. Uh, and it means like any word, it means a lot of things depending on the context. For Marshall McLuhan, he published this book in 1964 called uh, Understanding Media, subtitled The Extensions of Man. And so we have we have a definition of a medium as an extension of man, as an extension of some human attribute, uh, body part, faculty, sense, um, which is wasn't really a new idea. Uh, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, in the late 19th century said that the body is the magazine of invention, the storehouse where uh, the patent office, where all the models of all the inventions are kept. Um, it's the same notion that, you know, our, our technologies, anytime we innovate, we come up with a technology. It's really to amplify or to extend some human uh, task or ability or attribute um, and to amplify it. Uh, to make it easier for us to do something or more efficient uh, to extend our reach or our abilities, right? That's one definition of medium. Um, another definition, which uh, he used more um, after Understanding Media was published, was uh, as an environment. And um, the a new technology, when it uh, kind of reaches a, a certain point, becomes environmental. And, and in that, very much taken for granted and inextricable from our, our culture, is the culture, really. Um, and like an environment, uh, it 
you know, there's there's no easy separation of parts. Environments tend to be entire things. And to to affect one part of the environment is to affect the total part of the environment, just as in our senses. Um, what the message is, Marshall put very, very plainly in understanding media, he said the message is the change in scale or pace or pattern that it introduces into human affairs. So those are those are the three main points: scale, pace, and pattern. Um, really, he breaks down the effects of technologies into these two orders: uh, the personal and the social. So, as I said earlier, you know, technologies affect us uh, in a perceptual, personal level, um, tinkering with who we are, uh, and then they affect us more broadly in a social level, tinkering with who we are. Not just our concept of ourselves, our those kind of identities, but who we are on fundamental levels. Um, a very interesting timing, AI and and COVID. Uh, the one, I think, kind of conceals the effect of the other a little bit uh, in a certain sense. But um, scale, pace, and pattern. Uh, we're not we're not the the same as we were. Um, and also there's, there's not really any going back. There's no putting the genie back in the bottle, um, as much as we would like to think it, uh, the very upsetting part about it is, is almost none of the actual effects of technologies are ever foreseen by us. You know, they become apparent, uh, after, after the genie's out of the bottle, after we are reshaped and the world around us is reshaped, we suddenly realize, oh, wow, I don't have uh, any attention span anymore. Oh, geez, my kids are an anxious and have ADHD and uh, you know don't know who they are physically or spiritually or mentally. You know, um, it's, it's all too true that the side effects uh, tend to add up and greatly outweigh uh, the main effects or the things that we design these things for, right? Like, um, still, that doesn't seem to stop us from doing it uh, <laughs> as much as as maybe it should, and um, we might we might want to look into that. Um, let's see. Well, I don't know. I guess that's a, a good enough for an opening gambit. That is more than good enough for an opening gambit. That's that's a condensed seminar. Uh, <laughs> thank you. All right. thank you. I spend uh, I spend three hours every Monday night um, teaching understanding media, and I guess I've gotten used to the sound of my own voice and and can go on and on and on, but. Um, I'm I'm really looking forward to hearing what what Jeff has to say. I'm hip, uh, <laughs> uh, and and you take me back. I am one of those children of the TV. I I was in front of a television, you know, at four years old. I didn't really start reading until I was in my mid-teens. I mean, the first time I really picked up books was probably really in college, and after that, I mean, I. I I consider him out, you know, better than average reader now, but I was just swept up by uh, TV. It just oh, completely actually, there was one more point I, I wanted to make, and you kind of reminded me of it. So let me close with this. Back to what McLuhan said in 1960 about uh, wondering whether introducing television or or photos before uh, reading and literacy might be an unfortunate sequence, uh, and how we only get uh, one chance to make a first impression. Well. Um, kids have a really hard time reading now and we don't uh, as educators seem to understand we have this crazy belief that teaching people to read on screens is anything but teaching them how to use computers the very important distinction there between the screen and the page and um there's, it's almost, it's a very much a losing proposition for the simple reason that you can give a child in a, in a baby carriage, a child who can't speak, who can barely gurgle, uh, a smartphone like this, and in less than a minute, they can make it work, right? They can use it. They can do stuff with it. 
you give a child a book in a baby carriage and it's a chew toy, right? It's uh, just something they can hold and turn around in their hands and it holds their interest for just about that long because it takes it takes years to turn this into something that you can use, right? And in the process of translating that technology into information, you're molding your, your brain, your sensorium and your neural pathways in uh, certain ways. You're gaining your, your mother tongue and your identity. Um, and if you teach the kid how to use the smartphone first, that's how you're shaping the kid. So, uh, you know, it wasn't exactly that Marshall or even my father banned the kids from from watching television, but they understood um, that you get what you get depending on um, how you start out. So I do the same thing. I My kids are eight and 10, and I've made sure that, well, I've done my best anyway to help them achieve some kind of literacy formation before they just turn into computers. This is, this is a great point, uh, Andrew, and it really gets to the heart of what we're trying to get at with this whole session and a series of sessions is literacy and AI literacy and teaching AI literacy, which is the whole point of trying to understand the medium or AI as a medium that, that generates literacy. Literacy teaching is one of the one of the foundational services of libraries. Traditional literacy, you know, media literacy, digital literacy, all these kind of uh, things come through the library and they're being asked to and have a general responsibility for helping people become literate, whatever that may mean. So now we have a new medium to redefine that, I suppose. And uh, we'll just see. We'll get back to that. I don't want to get too uh, sideways, but that's that's a key point to what we're doing today. Jeff, uh, please uh, take us take us back. Tell us how this this man came to be. This uh, he was he was a Joyce scholar, as I recall, and uh, and, and studied at Oxford and you know and literacy. Yeah, yeah. Yep. 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 Um, so, well, yeah, I, I'm um, first of all, I just wanted to say I really, really appreciated Andrew's comments. And I feel like what I'm about to go through is totally complimentary in the sense that it's on the sort of context of McLuhan's fame, especially after the 1964 book that Andrew mentioned called Understanding Media. And um, it really draws from my special interests in the kind of the sociology of academic fame and Marshall McLuhan. Uh, Andrew's grandfather remains the first and only media scholar that has ever kind of entered the celebrity orbit. Um, and he's done it a couple of times, actually. And I'm just going to quickly focus on the first. And I will, with apologies, um, share because I have a couple of images to uh, show you. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Um, and OK. Can you see um, a blank screen there? There should be now um, a text. Well, I my special interest in a way with McLuhan, even though I'm also a historian of media studies, and I will just pause to say that Marshall McLuhan is without question the most important and influential figure in media theory, broadly speaking, which is to say those who focus on the impact of media and largely because of the um, fecundity of the medium is the message formulation and some of his thinking about that that um, Andrew went through. So my from a slightly different angle, I'm interested in his fame, right? And there's this whole genre of articles now that talks about this kind of thing. Um, but it started in the early 90s with this paper, How to Become a Dominant French Philosopher um, with Derrida. It uh, moved on to How to Become a Famous British Social Theorist, uh, with Anthony Giddens as the subject. And on and on, how to become a forgotten intellectual, um, how not to become a dominant French sociologist, um, et cetera. Well, so the question that I want to pose to you by way of narrating this extraordinary um, catapulting to celebrity status uh, of, of Marshall McLuhan in the 60s is why and 
why did he become famous and why did he fade? And um, you might ask, why has he uh, been revived since? Um, it may be ripe for revival, as Don was suggesting a couple of years ago. This is a shot from the famous cameo in uh, Annie Hall, 1972. Uh, uh, when he, in which McLuhan plays himself to a pompous um, media professor um, to set him right. Um, but the question really is, I want to just recount very briefly this theme, uh, especially from 1964 to 1967, and then go back in time briefly, and then finally just suggest maybe uh, an explanation or a proposed one for how he became so famous uh, so quickly. <clears throat> So for this first part, I just want to start back in 1964. This is well into McLuhan's uh, thinking even about media, but it was the, the book that ultimately led for him to show up on hour-long television series and the uh, covers of big U.S. newsweeklies and on and on and on. Um, so when he published this, he was a Cambridge-trained um, literary analyst, not that well-known outside of his fields. And three years later, 1967, he was on the cover of Newsweek, uh, this the Saturday Evening Review, um, <clears throat> and on and on. Um, so let me go back to 1965. Uh, he was discovered in a way that is totally um, uncommon by a pair of San Francisco-based prospectors. They were engaged in what they called genius scouting. One of them, um, a doctor, had read Understanding Media, this 1964 book, and alerted the other one, who's pictured here, Howard Gossage, um, an advertising agency, kind of avant-gardist. And they set out to create a conscious publicity campaign. Um, they, they really packaged and promoted McLuhan like he was a uh, promising would-be celebrity with, you could say, kind of multimedia gusto. Um, in May of that year, they flew out to, uh, well, they flew out to Toronto and they also in May brought uh, him, flew him to New York City where they arranged cocktail parties with the media and the publishing industry. Uh, the same month, the BBC aired a special, um, and they, uh, in August, they staged a week-long McLuhan Festival in San Francisco, um, complete with nightly parties. Um, this photo has Gossage there, one of those two prospectors I mentioned, uh, his partner with McLuhan uh, there on the right, and um, a San Francisco columnist, sorry, that's McLuhan there on the right, um, uh, Herb Kane and crucially Tom Wolfe, who's in the uh, uh, foreground, the last of the, the left lower circle there. I say crucially because Tom Wolfe was not yet the doyen of new journalism. Um, he was on assignment uh, this week for the New York Herald Tribune's magazine, New York, um, in which, sorry, that's that's Tom Wolfe. Um, and he, uh, uh, this was the uh, Herb Kane column that um, came after the McLuhan Festival. He wrote, hot on the trail of this Titan, I thought to myself, where is the last place in town you'd expect to see Marshall McLuhan? And that's where I found him, at Off-Broadway in North Beach, lunching amid the topless waitresses with writer Tom Wolfe, um, Gossage, and Feigen, these two prospectors. By September, uh, the New York Times had written up the, uh, the book um, in a feature, uh, there was another story in the New York Times. Um, by November, Wolf's, um, well, a, a magazine uh, called Harper's published a story on McLuhan. And most importantly, uh, Tom Wolf's piece for New York Magazine came out um, titled, What If He's Right? Um, suppose he is what he sounds like, the most important thinker since Newton, Darwin, Freud, Einstein, and Pavlov, he wrote in that piece. Fast forwarding to 1966, McLuhan was doing uh, speaking and consulting gigs um, for uh, uh, various entities like the American Marketing Association or the four A's, um, the Public Relations Society of America. There were spreads in Esquire and Fortune magazine, even Ramparts, the New York, the sort of new left student magazine um, had a feature on understanding Marshall McLuhan. Um, the ultimate mark of becoming Famous is arguably having a New Yorker cartoon reference you. And here is a son describing McLuhan to his dad in his book lined study, um, <clears throat> closing with, we, we again live in a village, get it? Um, and by 1967, the sluice gates had opened. There were collections, a uh, pair of essay collections published on McLuhan, Hot and Cool, that is to say, Pro and Con, um, another book with that name. He had, 
who's writing popular pieces for Look Magazine. He wrote or interviewed for TV Guide, Family Circle, Mademoiselle this year, Vogue, McCall's, and even Glamour. Uh, there was uh, an hour-long NBC show called This is Marshall McLuhan, also that same year on the BBC, CBC, NPR, and The Voice of America. Here he is on the cover of McCall's, um, referring <laughs> fittingly to the age of the McLuhan mobile. Um, here's the Newsweek magazine cover, The Message of Marshall McLuhan, Saturday uh, Review cover. Um, and even uh, in 1967, Columbia Records um, released a, an LP of The Medium is Massage, um, his 1967 co-authored book, um, very influential in its own right, um, released as a spoken LP. Uh, and and finally, and I will kind of um, wrap with this, there's plenty of time for uh, comments. He, he gave interviews for Playboy Bazaar and indeed had a um, well-known summit with John Lennon and Yoko Ono in 1969. And I'll just close with the, the point that um, what's fascinating is that McLuhan's um, origins, as Andrew hinted at, were in literary criticism. They were in the um, Cambridge-trained tradition of F.R. Levis. And he shared Levis's um, caustic take on popular culture. And without wasting more time right now, my um, basic take uh, on McLuhan's fame was that it wasn't merely the uh, publicity chops of these two San Francisco-based agents that helped catapult him. It wasn't merely the brilliance of understanding media, um, but it was a tonal shift in McLuhan's work that took place in this period in the early 1960s in which he uh, came to celebrate uh, the new medium television and assigned the kinds of uh, things that he was complaining about in his pre-1960s career about the um, sewage of American popular culture. He assigned that to a kind of typographic um, past that was um, with the advent of television and other electronic media um, on the way out. And it was this more affirmative take that uh, helped account for his um, um, extraordinary bout of fame, one which, as I kind of hinted before, would be reprised in the mid-1990s as he was anointed St. Marshall by Wired Magazine in the early era of the World Wide Web. Um, so why don't I just stop there in the interest of time so that we have uh, some ability to discuss. There's so much more to say um, uh, and so much more to learn, but um, I'll pass it over to you, Don. Well, <laughs> more time indeed, uh, Jeff. Uh, I, I'm sorry you had to <clears throat> uh, squeeze so much history into a uh, very few minutes. I mean, we each, each of those markers was fascinating and I can remember a good number of them, you know, having been there, been around for a while. Uh, it just, it upset the apple cart at the time. You know, everybody was just perplexed and fascinated uh, with this phenomena of, of this guy and the things he was saying. And it just, it really was, uh, was, was amazing. Um, ads uh something that uh, andrew referred to in advertising and uh, and gossage of course being a san francisco advertising uh guy uh seemed to be really the power of the moment that drove his popularity or certainly drove the money that was pushing at him to to take the stage and explain you know how to make better ads or make more powerful ads and so understanding McLuhan was a path to do that. And we've seen ads morph really. I mean, you talk about an old media becoming popular or, or sticking around, but you know, they don't all stay, Andrew. Uh, when was the last time you looked at a want ad, you know, in a newspaper and newspapers themselves have been eclipsed. They're, they're a dying art. And art is the word now for, for newspapers. I, I have no doubt they will some form. Yes, Jim. Oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, I just wanted to jump in right there with the point about ads and to pick up on something, Don, you had said before in passing what Andrew had said, which is um, uh, around media literacy. 
My very favorite McLuhan book um, is a book that's much, much less well-known than, than Understanding Media or another very important one called Gutenberg Galaxy from the early 60s, but instead The Mechanical Bride, this 1951 um, book that is essentially with obviously media literacy was not a phrase that was floating around, um, but McLuhan was teaching at a US Catholic university at the time and was an, um, you know, an, struck by the fact that his students weren't reading essentially. And he produced what is an absolutely brilliant take on mostly advertising, but other forms of, of popular culture in, in sort of snippet form in the idiom of advertising itself. That is the book is um, itself sort of using ad like slogans in order to kind of expose and sometimes playfully um, engage with the advertising culture around him on the theory that students, you know, his generation would, wouldn't get this point through a treatise um, of text, but instead would only kind of appreciate the media literacy message, if you want to call it that, via the very form he was in part critiquing. So that's called The Mechanical Bride, and it, it you can find it as a PDF online, and it is, um, I think, I still teach it to students as a kind of media literacy tool. Right. I, you make me uh, wonder how many of these volumes are actually on the shelves uh, of our various libraries. Um, the one that stands out to me being, as I say, kind of the TV kit, was uh, The Medium is the Massage. This this was extraordinary kind of multimedia short book, but just loaded uh, with images and, just, you know, a non-traditional uh, volume, but uh, he included uh, light as a medium, uh, you know, a light bulb. So that's that's kind of where I, I think I'd like to take us now is the nature of medium. What is a medium? Is AI a medium? Is, it, is the internet a medium? Has AI enclosed the internet? Well, we can, you know, we don't have to solve that one necessarily, but to understand what is a medium would be the first step on a path towards literacy. Would, would, can we agree on that? And if so, Andrew, what is that? Yeah, well, um, you know, first of all, because uh, Jeff brought up the mechanical bride uh, folklore of industrial man, that 1951 work, which is um, much lesser known but um, is arguably the first media literacy text because in, in the preface, um, he says, ours is the first generation in which many thousands of the best trained minds um, have been, I forget the exact wording past there, but have been trained to get inside the human mind. And he says, to get inside, to generate heat, not light is the object. And he's talking about advertising uh, mm. and, and PR. Uh, which, you know, we understand, we understand media literacy as equipping people to understand that the people behind uh, the media, quote unquote, you know, and by that they mean, you know, popular media like television and uh, social media and whatever, have an agenda. Um, and it's essentially propaganda, be that ideological or commercial um, but they have they have something that they're trying to achieve. So media literacy is trying to get you to understand that people have an agenda and you're at the table, but you're on the table, not so much sitting at it. Um, and that's media literacy. But uh, Marsha McLuhan was more interested in uh, a slightly different thing, and that's media ecology. Um, media literacy can only only really has anything to say about content. When you take away content, then you're looking at the form, then you're looking at the medium itself, and you're looking at the effect of the form, not so much the effect of the content. So, you know, where people <laughs> content to try and persuade you of something, um, the medium is the message because it's the form that's actually reshaping you on that basic sensory level. And uh, that is the much greater uh, change than, you know, trying to get you to buy uh, Cheerios over cornflakes, right? Those are kind of trivial things compared to. And in fact, I love the way that 
um, Marshall put it in 64, he said that content is the juicy piece of meat used to distract the watchdog of the mind. <laughs> well, because the, paradoxically, the content is actually the delivery mechanism for the changes provided by the medium. Uh, and Marshall there was was paraphrasing T.S. Eliot, who said that meaning is like the juicy piece of meat carried by the burglar to distract the watchdog of the mind. Uh, T.S. Eliot, along with James Joyce, being uh, one of Marshall McLuhan's heroes. Um, but I also I love that you brought up Jerry Fagan, uh, Dr. Fagan and uh, Gossage. Jerry Fagan, by the way, if anyone's interested, was a, a doctor of proctology and an amateur ventriloquist. And when you put those things together, you get a, a pretty funny combination. <laughs> but uh, the fascinating thing is that they called up, you know, uh, Gossage's wife puts out in her memoir that um, Gossage calls Marsha McLuhan and says, Dr. McLuhan, how would you like to be famous? And the really interesting thing is Marshall said, sure. Um, and people have made a big deal about, you know, the the celebrity and the fame and the rise of this academic into popular culture, which did not earn him any points with the, his fellow academics. While today, every academic is trying to be a public intellectual, back then it was unseemly for such a dignified position. And that has uh, gives you a bit of insight into how academics thought of him going forward. But um, one question, which I think I've ever heard anybody ask, is why? Why would Marsh McLuhan want to do this? And that is the critical question, I believe. Because um, Marshall didn't care about fame. He really didn't. Um, he saw it as a means, an opportunity. And uh, that same year that The Mechanical Bride came out in 1951, he wrote to Ezra Pound, who was at that point confined to a mental institution in Washington. Uh, and he wrote, this is one of the most badass things for a professor to say. He said, I am an intellectual thug who has been slowly accumulating an arsenal with every intention of using it. <laughs> yeah, That's a wild thing to say. But... Yeah. His point, coming back to the medium as the message, is that he had discovered that while we're all speaking and arguing about content and whether things are good or bad, we're being reshaped on fundamental ways, personally and socially. And this is happening regardless of censorship, regardless of content. You know, he said it doesn't matter whether it produced Cadillacs or cornflakes, the message of machine technology was the effect it had on society, regardless of the use, you know, yeah. how it rewired us. And he said yes to Fagan and Gossage because he saw this as an opportunity to try and get these ideas out into the world uh, in order to, as he also said to Pound, needle the somnambulus. That is, get us to wake up. Um, and it worked in that we're sitting here right now talking about it wherever we are in the world. Uh, so, you know, exactly. I think he had some measure of success in that, in I that regard. I would, I would answer that. Uh, why did he, why did he seek fame or accept fame, uh, as another medium? I mean, he wrote books to get, you know, to share his ideas, to influence people and, and society. And I think he used fame the same way. It was a, a medium. A, a, yeah, and he, he understood that a book was was a <laughs> hundred years earlier, a book might have been a vehicle one kind of vehicle. And in his age, a book is only going to get you so far. So just like um he did that collaboration with Quentin Fiore, uh, the medium is the massage, an in inventory of effects. Very important subtitle there. Um, but that book was also turned into a, a record in LP. And it was turned into a, a short film as well through uh, through McGraw. Um, and uh, Marshall understood that the way to get your message out was through the popular media of the day. Um, and he probably saw that it would one day also be the content of a new medium, 
which he saw coming. And now um, he's all over the internet on YouTube and, and everywhere else. So yeah. back again. Yeah. He also said uh, all advertising advertises advertising. At least I thought I remembered him saying being uh, known for saying that, which gets to your point, uh, you know, that the, that the thing once, once we see the context of the thing, the context becomes an object and the thing, which was an object, you know, transforms. And then the context becomes a new object inside of some new invisible context, which we're trying to figure out today in terms of AI, which we know exists, but we don't exactly know what it is. So um, how, how would either of you go about, Jeff, well, I'll start with you. How would you go about constructing a literacy program for AI? Yeah, assuming if we can agree it is a medium, but it doesn't even have to be, but uh, if, if we do, we I guess there's a, a literacy attached to it, which is a strange term, right? Literacy is bound in a meet, a, pro, a long prior medium, but we're using it in you know electronic uh, circumstances. But how would how would you approach that, Jeff? It's a yeah, it's I'm a thinking question today. Yeah, taking Andrew's point about media literacy and sort of media ecology, and keeping that in mind, I've one thing I do with my students in data, data kind of critical data studies classes that, that touch on artificial intelligence is have them actually build models. I mean, the, the act of creating media is often really the best way to um, instill a critical mindset um, and questioning uh, approach in students. And so, for example, Google has a, um, you know, not unproblematically given that it's Google, but a, a teachable machine that allows students to create machine learning models. And in the process, I have them write up their experience and reflection, having read some critical pieces, you know, troubling Google's um, at the time near monopoly uh, in, in AI. And in that way, I feel like in, in the spirit of the mechanical bride and its use of the advertising medium itself to critique advertising, um, media literacy that asks students to make in the medium they're trying to understand and critique is a really fruitful approach. Good. Very good. You know, we are, uh, go ahead. Make, uh, I just want to say, Andrew, uh, we are we are at the hour here. So why don't we use this last minute for closing statements? So please say whatever you'd like to leave us with. And I, you know, I wish we had three hours at least today, but which is what we got today. So I think we've got captured a lot, but how would you leave us, Andrew? Yeah, it's 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 hard to have this quest this discussion when um you know there's so much context to provide. It's almost if, as if we've just really opened <laughs> opened the matter, but um one interesting uh, fact about the mechanical bride uh which was uh put out through Vanguard Press in New York is that it was remaindered before it was published. That is, it was never sold in stores, uh, the first edition, which is very interesting. Um, advertising people weren't too happy uh, to have the spotlight turned on advertising. Uh, they, don't, they don't like that at all. Um, Marshall threw a giant spotlight on media, or tried to. And interestingly enough, Kim there, uh, who teaches at U of T at the Faculty of Information, um, which isn't a huge fan of Marshall McLuhan, uh, it's kind of funny, uh, the relationship of the university to McLuhan is, is similarly fraught. Um, univer uh, U of T, and I have friends there and whatever, I don't like to paint too broad a brush, but U of T, uh, and maybe even Canada, likes to likes to taunt flaunt its heroes when it when it suits its purposes and, and maybe taunt it when it doesn't and that is u of t will say great minds studied at u of t with a big banner in marshall McLuhan's face but um how does it actually remember marshall McLuhan? and as wolf said what if he is what he sounds like the most important thinker since darwin freud and einstein well you know there's a darwin institute and museum Einstein, Freud, 
uh, how do we how do we remember and treat Marsha McLuhan? Actually, the most that Canada does is there's a room in the Berlin Embassy called the Marsha McLuhan Salon. There's there's no such thing here in Canada except the McLuhan Institute, which I started and is in a two story barn uh, in the country in rural Ontario. So it's very interesting. But um, uh, I guess one thing when it comes to AI or understanding any technology, you understand it as as an instrument um, and as an environment, as something with personal sensory effects and social effects as well. And one way to, to start to get at its nature is to um, follow the subtitle of the medium is the massage, and that is to perform an inventory of effects. Um, start to make a list, really, on a, on a big blackboard or whiteboard. Start to make an inventory uh, of effects, of changes. And when you start to add all those up, that is the medium. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Jeff, a last word. Well, yeah, I know we're at time. I just wanted to highlight um, the point that Andrew made just before the last one about uh, which I think resonates with the kind of point about the vagaries of academic fame and recognition and prominence. So that question that I tried to cover in an earlier era, um, Andrew fittingly ended with. And thank you, Don, and everyone else for sticking around for this hour. Most welcome. And, and we're just so pleased that you could both make the time and share your insights, brilliant insights into this topic, I guess we could say, a uh, subject area of uh, exploration, uh, probing the the mind of McLuhan and the results, the impact since, which continue to, to this day and likely into the future as well. Um, I, I, I think the book, The Medium is the Massage, is highly recommended. It's It's fun. It's challenging at the same time. Picking up understanding media is going to take a while. The medium is a massage is, you know, you can you can get through it in a in an afternoon. You may not understand everything, but you will you will be the better for it. Uh great, please. Yes, that's the original, that's the original book. It's been reprinted. Uh it, it came back into popularity. Uh, Wired published it, republished it in the in the mid-90s, uh, uh, suitably. Um the, and and I'm glad you mentioned uh, the uh, Berlin uh, Center there, Andrew. It's a it's a perfect segue uh, because uh, that that center hosted our next week's speaker, who is Corey Doctorow, who's coming back. And, and he was I don't know if they gave him an award there, but they hosted him, and he gave this lecture on his you know his current rap on uh, inshitification of commerce and you know society at large. So. Uh, please come back for that one. I believe we have uh, kind of tried today to step back and sort of rebuild awareness through through this sort of foundational person and work as we try to get to the present with understanding AI and and what to do about it and how to learn about it and how to teach it and how to how to cope with it. So that said, I want to thank everybody for being here, and uh, we'll have this up on our uh, YouTube channel, Libraries and Response YouTube channel. Please subscribe, and uh, it'll be there for posterity, or whatever that means, digital posterity, as long as uh, the, the electrons keep flowing. And so we'll see you next time. So with that, I will close the recording.